The callously inhuman, torturous, and deadly nature of Japanese POW and civilian internment and labor camps have been made infamous to post-war generations through movies like Bridge Over the River Kwai, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, Empire of the Sun, and more recently, Unbroken. Movies that only open a small window into a world of abuse and mistreatment managed by willfully incompetent and sadistically brutal men. I'm Spartacus Olson, and this is a World War II in real time special on Japanese POW camps. In this first special on the topic, we will look at the varying quality of treatment and some telling incidents in the Japanese POW camp system. It is the first of a few videos that I will do on the topic during the coming years. I will do separate videos about Japanese civilian concentration camps and Chinese POWs, as these are treated vastly differently. Now, we've looked at a variety of World War II camps so far, the fairly well-managed and relatively benign, although unconstitutional and inhumane, U.S. concentration camps for Japanese Americans, the uniquely brutal Nazi concentration camp system, the German starvation camps for Red Army BOWs, the gulag system in the Soviet Union, the Ustasha concentration and murder camps in Yugoslavia, the Jewish ghettos in eastern Germany, the dichotomy of the deadly and life-saving Italian concentration camps, the extremely deadly Romanian expulsion of Jews into a prison state in Transnistria, and the more recently established Nazi transit camps and extermination factories. All of them share one thing in common, a systematic unilateral treatment of their victims based on an ideological idea of race, ethnicity, or some other idea of being undesirable. The Japanese camps, while also racist in nature, are different by being based on brutal, ad hoc pragmatism for gain rather than a system, a general disdain for the defeated more than an overarching ideological goal and that they are often deliberately put under the management of incompetent commandants. If you have seen our coverage of the German camps and the gallery about Nazi camp commandants, you will see a difference here. The Nazi system promotes initiative, and the commandants strive to excel in their murderous horrors, even competing to outdo each other in creating systems to kill as many as possible per day, and finding mechanical methods of atrocity. The commandants become stars within the SS and Nazi echelons. The Japanese camps, on the other hand, are at the lowest rung on the military hierarchy. The mistreatment, abuse, torture, and murder is suggested from above and carried out as a matter of policy. Obviously, in both cases, the most casual observer can see the common denominator of sadistic pleasure in harming others. There are, for instance, numerous recorded cases of competitions in mass murder of as many as possible among the Japanese, too. But it is not by creating a system, but doing things like beheading, impaling, or shooting as many people as you can in a row. It's more of an ad hoc system of terror that is part and parcel of the general abusive character of Japanese militarism at the time. A system where the goals justify the means at every turn, and inhumanity has become a culture, almost a code of conduct. The perpetrators are known to us by name from their later trials. Their acts are known from their reports and the witness borne by survivors and bystanders. But we know little about them as individuals, rendering it difficult to make a portrayal of them. But as we will see, like in the German system, the commandants are different from each other in their implementation of policy and undeniably in personal control of how much terror and abuse they inflict or allow to be inflicted on the people under their charge. Just like the mistreatment is an ad hoc system, so are the camps themselves created according to the progress of the war and the opportunities and perceived needs that presents. As Japan prepares for an expanded war in late 1941, they create the POW Information Bureau to lay out policy and management of the prisoners expected from the conquest of European and American colonies in Southeast Asia. They soon have to handle 350,000 captured Allied soldiers. They are, 
Americans, Brits, Dutch, Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians, Filipinos, Indians, and Indonesians. In accordance with the Japanese Pan-Asian Imperial Domination Doctrine, the Bureau decides that many ethnic Asian prisoners are to be let go, or even enlisted in the Japanese ranks. This leaves roughly 140,000 Allied soldiers, mostly of European ethnicity, in Japanese captivity by early 1942. By Japanese military tradition, these men are scoundrels and cowards who have failed in their duty to die fighting. Even to handle them as captors is a disgrace, and the job to do so is mostly given to officers of questionable competency at best. They are sent out to set up makeshift camps, often in old garrison buildings of the former colonial armies. But at first, the task lands with the general rank and file of the Imperial Army, like after the Battle of Singapore, when 50,000 Allied POWs are crammed into the old coastal fort of Changji in the nearby Selerang barracks. They are under command by Lieutenant Ukasaki, who will be remembered by the prisoners as relatively kind and hands-off in his style as commandant. The complex of separate buildings are hugely overcrowded, and at first there is a huge deficit of sanitary facilities, food, and medical care. But Okasaki implements a hands-off administration, allowing the British officers to find their own solutions for feeding, housing, and caring for the imprisoned troops. They are even allowed to move freely between the disparate parts of the camps, thus effectively leaving the camp to go from one building complex to the other. At times, they are given leave to go into the city to scavenge for livestock or tools and equipment to improve the camp. They practice sports and religion freely. But the Allied prisoners see it as their duty to try to escape, a duty guaranteed to be carried out without severe and special penalty according to the laws of war. But these laws are based on conventions that Japan does not recognize, and insubordination of that kind is to them intolerable, even incomprehensible. And when some prisoners do escape, the relationship between captors and captives start to deteriorate. In spring, three SKPs are caught and executed summarily as a warning. The inmates are tasked with barbed wiring their own encampment, the number of guards are increased by a contingent of former British Sikh soldiers who have been turned and joined the Japanese army. The largely white Anglo-Saxon prisoners are outraged and protest when they are forced to salute these guards each time they meet. The Allied officers in charge are stripped of their rank insignia and only allowed to wear a star to indicate their higher status. The number of abusive punishments for transgressions increases, and in July, most of the officers are sent to camps in Japan proper on orders from Tokyo. We'll get back to that in a minute. None of this ends the attempts by the prisoners to escape. To the contrary, it sees them even more motivated. In August 1942, the command of all POW complexes on the Malay Peninsula and in Singapore are handed over to Lieutenant General Shinpei Fukuye. Okasaki remains in charge of Changji for now, but only in an administrative role. The more recently erected civilian concentration camps also in Okasaki's charge are handed over to the military and secret police, the Kempatai, and we will get back to what happens there in later episodes of the regular War Against Humanity series. Fukuye wants an end to the escape attempts and tries to pressure the prisoners into signing a no escape pledge. They see this as an infringement of their protected rights as POWs and refuse. In early September, four SKPs are again caught and Fukuye decides to force the POWs hands collectively by cramming around 17,000 POWs into the Celerang barracks designed to accommodate 800. When this doesn't convince the Allied soldiers, the four SKPs are executed in plain sight of everyone. Later, the trial records of Fukuye will show. All four prisoners refused to be blindfolded, and 16 shots were fired before it was decided that the men were dead. One of the prisoners, Corporal Bevington, a big Australian, made a vain last-minute plea to be allowed to bear alone the full responsibility and punishment for the attempt to escape. He dies reading the New Testament. The first two shots passed through his arm, and as he lay on the ground, he shouted, You shot me through the arm! For God's sake, finish me this time! 
After a few more days without food, water, or proper sanitary facilities, the Allied soldiers reluctantly agreed to sign the pledge. Though many use fake names, the Australians often signing Ned Kelly, the name of the infamous 19th century Australian road bandit and bank robber often hailed as a freedom fighter. For most of the prisoners, Changi is, however, only where their journey through hell begins, as they will be transferred to various camps all over the empire and occupied territories. Eventually, there will be a few hundred POW camps, mostly labor camps, managed by the Japanese army. Inmates have to work in mines, factories, or are put to work in large infrastructure projects, many even in Japan proper. Labor duty is already an idea from the start of the war, but spottily implemented. In June 1942, it becomes policy when Prime Minister Hideki Tojo orders camp commandants that you must supervise them rigidly insofar as you do not become inhuman and not let them remain idle even for a single day. Let me translate that. Tojo is expressing the idea that humanity is only defined by how productive someone is, in the case of the POWs, for the Japanese war economy. So bringing them to Japan and forcing them to work is in and of itself humane treatment, regardless of the circumstances. And already the thousands of miles journey to the camps overseas is a terror. The vessels used become known as hell ships. Being crammed, lacking basic provisions and sanitary services, is not the main reason that a great many won't survive the journey, though. Most casualties are because the ships fly ordinary Japanese war flags, but are not defended by convoys against Allied submarines and airplanes, who frequently target them unaware that they are killing their own allies and countrymen. Those who do arrive in Japan will be accommodated in one of the homeland camp and subcamp complexes. By the end of the war, there will be seven camp complexes, with a total of 81 subcamps in Japan proper. Most subcamps are fairly small and located near mines or industrial areas. The conditions are generally harsh. Many will succumb to malnutrition, disease, and overwork. Others die under the often indifferent and sometimes brutal camp guards. They are commanded by mid-level reserve officers of the Imperial Army. Some run their camps like bureaucrats and make a proper effort to treat the POWs only as badly as their own lowest-ranking soldiers, while others go further. One of the camp systems is named Fukuoka, located in the south of Japan, just below Nagasaki. It begins operation in November 1942. Multiple sources suggest that this must have been one of the worst places to end up as an Allied POW. It is led by Colonel Iju Sugazawa. Among the first captives here are a number of RAF airmen who are interned in a subcamp run by Captain Yuichi Sakamoto and 22 guards. The senior RAF man, Lieutenant Colonel Martin D.S. Saunders, will report that while living conditions at Fukuoka 1 are reasonable at first, that is, despite the commander Sakamoto, who he describes as an uneducated man of brutal and callous temperament. Apparently, Sakamoto and his translator Takeo Katsura are fierce adepts of the idea that POWs are disgraceful for their weakness and lack of honor. They systematically beat their defenseless prisoners for no reason. Often Sakamoto and Katsura do the beating themselves, sometimes for hours on end. Many die as a consequence, and the mortality rate at Fukuoka 1 is high. While the camp has a capacity of roughly 400 prisoners simultaneously, 147 will die here during the war. The other camps in the Fukuoka camp system aren't necessarily better. At Fukuoka 6, for instance, prisoners work for the Takamatsu Mining Company, and at Fukuoka 17 for the Miiki coal mine for Mitsui. Prisoners from both camps report excessive corporal punishment, and the prisoners who attempt to escape are stabbed to death. Colonel Iju Sugazawa will be sentenced to death for his mistreatment of POWs after the war is over. Overall, 32,418 Allied prisoners of war will have been forced to work in Japan proper, with one in ten dying, which, as terrible as that sounds, makes it one of the less terrible places to end up. From May 1942 onwards, 
between 50 and 55,000 allied POWs and roughly 200,000 Asian forced conscripts called Ramusha are forced to work on the Thai Burma Railway. The camps used along this railway are the stage of horrendous scenes, atrocities, and tragedies, with sometimes over 50% fatality rate. The highest death rates won't come from direct abuse, though, but from staggering neglect and willful incompetence. Like in the second branch camp in Thailand, under command of Commandant Yanagida Shuichi, where 100,000 captives live in a place that doesn't really deserve the name camp for it is a swampy, unsanitary wasteland without any medical care or even proper roofs. As the monsoon hits, they will die like flies from disease and malnutrition when all supplies are cut off. In the Malaya No. 4 camp under Hiroki Itano of the roughly 7,000 POWs half die from cholera. The camp commandant seems not even capable of doing anything because as one allied officer later reports, he is an incompetent old absent-minded man who would often walk around muttering about the poor miserable POWs. But not all Japanese in charge are monsters or incompetent fools. Take Lieutenant Colonel Tatsuji Suga, for example. He is the overall commandant of the POW and civilian camps in Borneo. He will be remembered by inmates as a reasonable, at times even friendly, man. He is reported to increase rations whenever he visits the different camps, to give prisoners short holidays, and to bring sweets and gifts for the children of Dutch civilian internees. Now, this kinder approach sometimes triggers an extra violent one from officers who revert the ration increase once he's gone, and ultimately he too will cut rations down to starving levels under army command pressure. Overall, of the officially reported 132,134 POWs to have been in Japanese captivity, 35,756 don't survive, a casualty rate of 27%. That number comes from the Japanese war crimes trial and is conservative, as it doesn't include most non-Western soldiers. In reality, the casualty rate might very well be one in every three. But the death rates vary greatly from camp to camp and region to region. If anything, this shows that as much as it is a culture of systematic abuse put in place by the Japanese leadership, each act of violence, each decision to torture, abuse, or murder is a personal choice by someone in immediate charge of another defenseless human being. Like with all atrocities across the fronts of this war, the perpetrators will claim that they were simply following orders, doing their duty for honor and country. Their choices make them something else, though. Contemptible sadists by lust or incompetence who failed humanity and soiled Japan's honor in the most despicable way. Never forget. Mm -hmm.